Hello everyone. In today's video, we will begin our study of John Milton's epic poem, Paradise Lost. Today, we'll look at the first 26 lines, very famous opening invocation to the poem, where Milton is uh, standing astride the classical traditions of the past in beginning his epic with an invocation to the muses. Although here there will be a bit of a twist, which we'll see in just a moment. Uh, Paradise Lost was first published in 1667 uh, in 10 books. It was later republished in 1674 in its, in its 12 books in its current volume. It was written by 17th century English poet John Milton, uh, who was a, a, a monumental figure in English poetry, very erudite, scholarly man, very controversial figure. Uh, and you'll see some of that controversy measured out in the poem. Paradise Lost is well known for being a, a very intricate and detailed and complex work of art. It is magnificent, uh, but also uh, quite um, intimidating, uh, especially to a first reader. Uh, it is a, a beautiful portrait of the history of the human race. It is a, a compelling and splendid narrative of the fall of man. We get that invoked in the opening line of man's first disobedience. And Milton himself, uh, he wrote this later in his life. Uh, he uh, was a controversial figure, as I mentioned. He was heavily involved in the English civil wars uh, under Cromwell. He was later imprisoned and, and almost killed for his involvement in the interregnum. And he was a blind poet. Uh, and that theme, that motif of blindness is going to appear uh, in this poem, uh, it's going to appear uh, almost immediately in the invocation as well, where he'll he'll offer in his prayer to the Holy Spirit a particular statement uh, where he says, what in me is dark, illumine. And the notion of illumination uh, from God as the ultimate light, the illumination of the poet himself to see what is most true and good and beautiful about redemptive history, the narrative of the human experience, uh, for man to see what his obligations are in obedience to God uh, versus his inability to see that once he is deceived, his sight and his spirit being shrouded by lies and deceit from Satan. All of these things will appear throughout the book, and they, they find their genesis in the opening 26 lines. I say the word genesis with a slight pun. Um, because you will see Milton constantly hearkening back to a scriptural authority in his writing of Paradise Lost. He will blend the classical and the scriptural traditions into what he calls his adventurous song, as he tries things yet unattempted in prose or rhyme. Um, Paradise Lost is written in blank verse. Just a little bit about the, uh, the form. Blank verse is uh, defined as unrhymed iambic pentameter. So he uses uh, Shakespeare's cadence, Shakespeare's meter, the iambic pentameter that you might find in one of Shakespeare's sonnets. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. The ba-bump, 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 ba-bump of iambic pentameter. Yet blank verse is unrhymed. You'll notice at the ends of the lines, his iambic pentameter is unrhymed, which is a mainstay of the poem, a very uh, pivotal feature of the structure of the poem. But the unrhymed iambic pentameter also suggests the lingering music and cadence of beauty aching to be restored by the harmony of rhyme. The unrhymed pentameter gives a dual effect of structure and form while also recognizing that things are not quite what they could be. They're not quite perfect. Something has been lost uh, at the very end of the line, which again undergirds uh, Milton's purposes here to suggest that paradise, the very seat and scenario of man's perfect bliss and happiness has been lost. And it's been lost by man's disobedience. Another main motif of the poem will center on the question of authority the concept of obedience, uh, man as a creature, man and woman, and indeed the whole human race as creatures who are designed and purposefully placed in Eden 
as a feature of the overall cosmos that God has created. Uh, that there is a music of the spheres. There is a, a deep dance and a harmonious uh, union of all things within God's created order. And therefore, they are to function according to God's design and God's order. And therefore, disobedience or a breaking of that authority poses a, a, a deep threat to the, the harmony of man's soul. Uh, this has a rich tradition with Plato's view of the soul. Uh, it has a, a view with Augustine's order of the loves, the ordo amoris, the order of our affections need to be rightly ordered in, uh, in order for us to flourish. Uh, the soul needs to be rightly aligned in order to account for human flourishing and therefore disorder or disunity or disobedience where the, the head is not ruling the body, where the governing authorities are not in their right hierarchy poses a dismantling of the entire human, a dismantling of the entire affair. And so we're going to see all of those things interlaced throughout Paradise Lost, but particularly in this opening invocation. I want to talk for a bit about the classical epic, the classical epic form that Milton is uh, intentionally situating Paradise Lost into. We're thinking of the the forms that Homer and Virgil embody, and even the Christian forms of Dante and Spencer, uh, Milton is following a long line of tradition, epic tradition and custom. And there are many key features of the epic that uh, Milton falls in line with. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the first of which is the invocation of a muse, which we see here, the subject and the verb of this opening sentence that sprawls across 16 lines is an invocation for the heavenly muse to sing to the poet, to exalt the poet uh, in order to achieve that which he is attempting to do, his adventurous song. Uh, but unlike the muses of the classical tradition, uh, Calliope and others, Milton invokes the aid of the heavenly muse. And later on, he'll give uh, reference to the, the heavenly muse as the Holy Spirit, the third person of the triune God. <coughs> so this opening invocation to the muse fits this classical form. Also, uh, beginning the epic with uh, a song of man's actions, man's heroics man's deeds. Uh, you think of uh, the invocation at the beginning of the Odyssey, where we're, where we're about to follow Odysseus on his grand quest, or with uh, Aeneas and his quest with the founding of Rome in Virgil's Aeneid, um, even all the way down to Tolkien with the Lord of the Rings, where we follow uh, the quest of Frodo Baggins to destroy the One Ring. Uh, it's, a, it's a feature of the epic to follow the quest of a man as the hero whose actions sprawl across this vast landscape and who come to embody many of the values of the culture that produced that epic. Interestingly, though, Milton, in contrast, begins his epic not with man's glories and conquests and heroics, but Milton opens with a shocking subject, man's failure. That here we have an epic not of victory, but of defeat. And in so doing, he rather inverts that epic form with the beginning of his, uh, of his poem here. So let's get down to the text. Of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree whose mortal taste brought death into the world and all our woe with loss of Eden till one greater man restore us and regain the blissful seat, sing heavenly muse. Now the sentence continues, but I just want to pause there on the opening six lines to draw attention to some things that are occurring. You can see the iambic pentameter in the opening line of man's first disobedience and the fruit. Da dump, da dump, da dump, da dump, da dump. This is that unrhymed iambic pentameter. But I want to draw out a possibility here that 
uh, there is some disagreement over Anthony Esselin. I, I once asked him about this and he uh, seems to disagree about it. But it's interesting how the iambic pentameter, the perfect meter of the lines of that forbidden tree whose mortal taste brought death into the world and all our woe, that cadence uh, frames or structures the whole poem in this uh, rather precise metrical line. However, there's a possibility that in the very opening line of his 12 book poem, we might have a break in that otherwise perfect meter of man's first dis, o, b, d, -ence, and the fruit. Dum, 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 dum. So there's your iambic line. Yet this slurring of syllables right here on the word disobedience seems to break the otherwise smooth and perfect cadence of the line. <coughs> of man's first disobedience and the fruit. In order for that to function as one unaccented syllable to keep the iambic pairings of man's first disobedience and the fruit, it's interesting how that has to slur together in order to keep the harmony of the line. But also th think that form, that formal moment where the iambic pentameter seems to break a bit. Notice the word on which that hiccup occurs. The word disobedience. The word disobedience itself in this line, in the very middle of this line, breaks or disrupts the otherwise perfect harmony of the meter. If it weren't for disobedience, this poetic line would be perfect. And what a marvelous note on the content of the poem. If it weren't for this disobedience, the harmony and precision and beauty and perfection of the line would be unhindered. It would be unbroken. It would be perfectly joined. And yet it's the intrusion of this disobedience right in the center of this line that breaks the harmony of it. It breaks the beauty of it. And this is the whole point of Milton's poem. Man's first disobedience and the fruit of that tree. Notice the fruit being Milton's enjambment here leaves that word right at the end. That fruit is the literal fruit, but it also means the result or the outcome of that choice, which affects all our woe and affects all of us. We see this first person plural here that Milton opens up to. All mankind has suffered or been damaged or wounded by the fruit of that disobedience, a very disobedience that breaks the the music of the line breaks the, the beauty and the bliss of Eden into an experience of universal woe from then till now. Of man's first disobedience, there will be many more disobediences to follow. And that word first occurs several times in the invocation. We'll try to track that as we go. Of man's first disobedience, and the fruit of that forbidden tree. Notice that emphasis on authority again, a key motif to this whole poem. We'll see this with Satan as well. Satan's struggle, to put it lightly, to understate it, with authority. His famous line, better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. Um, the question of authorship, whose world do we live in? Whose narrative is being told? Who is the point of highest authority? There's no such thing as an empty throne. Someone or something will occupy the seat of highest authority in every person's worldview, in every person's belief. So who is the author? Who is the one that we must obey? Who is the one that has forbidden the tree? So this brings in Milton's uh, Christian view of God as the point of highest authority over his creation, including man. Of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree, whose mortal taste, notice the introduction of death. It's a mortal taste. Mortality is introduced with the taste of the fruit. Brought, the taste brought death into the world. And all our woe. 
all our woe, look at these totalizing, all of mankind's woe comes with the loss of Eden. And we need to be careful here because it's not necessarily for Milton the loss of a place. It's the loss of a person. That when we lost Eden, we lost our place. We lost our, our office. We lost our role as lords of the earth besides. We lost our ability to govern the earth well. We lost our ability to govern our soul well. Everything became disordered. But we also lost the person. And this would be a relationship with God. For Milton, the greatest, greatest despair was not the loss of Eden, uh, not even the loss of a pure harmony with one another, the relationship between Adam and Eve, but rather it was a loss of the relationship with God. And then we get this anticipation, till one greater man restore us. This is Milton anticipating the second Adam, which would be Christ. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is the greater Adam, the greater man, uh, the second Adam, where the first Adam disobeys at a tree. The second Adam will obey on a tree. The second Adam, Christ, will submit to the authority of God, that he will go to the cross, that he will pour himself out as an offering. We'll see this in book three when, when the son and the father commune together over uh, grace and redemption offered to Adam and Eve. So the greater man is this uh, inkling that the poem will end well, that there will be some sense of comedy to the poem, that the greater man will restore what has been lost and regain the blissful seat. Sing heavenly muse. And then we get several references throughout the canon of scripture here. Sing heavenly muse that on the secret or holy set apart, the holy, the secret top of Oreb or of Sinai. These are both mountains in the Old Testament related to Moses, that shepherd. Sing heavenly muse that on the secret top of Oreb or of Sinai didst inspire that shepherd. Notice that verb inspire, uh, which is again, part of the epic tradition to gain inspiration from the muses. But here to inspire literally means to breathe into. We're gonna see that literal use of a word as part of Milton's uh, style later when he talks about instructing which means literally to build, to in structure. So to inspire, to breathe into uh, that shepherd, Moses, who first taught the chosen seed. Remember, here's what's forbidden and here's what's chosen. We get this point of authority yet again. There is a seed chosen by God. There is a tree forbidden by God. There is a law to which man must obey. Didst inspire that shepherd who first taught the chosen seed in the beginning. There's our overt biblical reference to Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, but also to John 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Who first taught the chosen seed in the beginning, how the heavens and earth rose out of chaos. We'll see that word again a few lines from now as the abyss. Which recall from Genesis 1, the Holy Spirit, the heavenly muse, broods over the waters. He broods over the abyss, out of which God will create the heavens and the earth out of nothing. Or, now we get two more references. If Zion Hill delight thee more, and Siloah's brook. So Zion's hill would be Mount Zion, the site of Solomon's temple. Also, uh, a very important reference made in Revelation with the future of Christ's second coming with Zion as the new and the holy mountain of those in the new covenant. Or if Zion Hill delight thee more and Siloah's brook that flowed fast by the oracle of God. This is an interesting reference, the oracle of God being the holiest place in the temple, the tabernacle of the Ark of the Covenant in 1 Kings. But also Siloah's brook. This is a reference uh, in John 9, especially in the New Testament, although there are others, where Jesus heals the blind man. 
uh, he tells him to wash in in the bro- in Siloam's brook, um, the brook of Siloam. And here's where Jesus mixes the dirt with spit into clay and and heals the blind man. And so the blind man here and the reference of the blind gaining sight is certainly interesting in light of the poem where a uh, man who is, by virtue of disobedience, lost in darkness, darkness visible, Milton will say, um, is in need of illumination, in need of inspiration, in need of instruction and light. But also, this is a reference, I would argue, to Milton himself. Milton as the speaker of the poem, Milton as the creator of the poem, Milton as the blind man approaching God for sight, for light. And so that reference to John 9 of the blind man and his healing by Christ is even more uh, powerful in light of its uh, autobiographical elements. And Salo's brook that flowed fast by the oracles of God, the oracle of God, I thence invoke thy aid to my adventurous song. So here's that epic form as well. Invoke thy aid to my adventurous song, which is the adventure of the poem, like Odysseus's adventure or like Aeneas's adventure or even Dante's adventure through hell and purgatory to paradise. But yet this is also a daring adventure. Something he is attempting with no middle flight. His song intends to soar above the Aeonian Mount. This would be Mount Helicon, uh, the Mount of the Muses. He says, this song intends to soar above the the Aeonian Mount while it pursues things unattempted yet in prose or rhyme. And that's the end of sentence one. 16 lines with magnificent syntax and phrasing throughout. But notice how he's saying that his song will go above the Aeonian Mount. So he is standing on the traditions of the past, but he is seeking to reach higher than that. Uh, It's possible even that Milton argues that his poem will transcend beyond those of Homer and Virgil because of his subject matter. What he's taking on is not the heroics of a particular people group or a particular time. In fact, what he's taking on is the relative failure and futility of man's efforts. He is striking big. He's going for the cosmic story, the divine story. Uh, Later on, what he'll suggest to be his primary aim is to assert eternal providence and justify the ways of God to men, which what a uh, what a massive undertaking to try to justify the ways of God, to traffic in the ways of God, to defend God to men. He goes above the Aeonian Mount while it pursues things unattempted yet. Notice this root word of tempt, the notion of temptation which, of course, the fruit of that forbidden tree, the temptation to overreach. And this is something that literature has treated uh, constantly throughout time, the, the notion of overreaching. You think of Dr. Faustus uh, reaching beyond his limits to have uh, knowledge that is forbidden, making his bargain with Mephistopheles. Uh, you think of Dr. Frankenstein in Mary Shelley's novel, reaching beyond the limits in the frame of man, Uh, to be able to reanimate life. And here, that central temptation, which we'll see with Eve as she's deceived by the serpent, is also at the root here of what Milton is attempting. He's attempting something that has been unattempted yet in prose or rhyme. And chiefly thou, O Spirit. So this is his heavenly muse, the Holy Spirit of God. Chief, O Spirit. Chiefly thou, that dost prefer before all temples the upright heart and pure. So we've had three stages uh, with reference to the presence of God. We had the presence of God of God in the Old Testament, the mountains of Oreb and Sinai with Moses. We had the presence of God with Mount Zion, 
and Siloah's brook, with Christ especially there. And then we have the presence of God and the Holy Spirit in the upright heart. This is something that Paul will reinforce in the New Testament about the Holy Spirit's dwelling places with man. God dwells with man, Emmanuel, God with us, that the Holy Spirit's residence is not in a particular temple built by human hands, but rather in the heart of those who believe. Before all temples, the upright heart and pure instruct me. I mentioned this earlier, how this word literally means to build into, to end structure, to instruct. Notice he's just talked about structures. The spirit prefers before all temples, the upright heart and pure, a structure that the spirit can build in me. For thou knowest. Thou knowest. Remember this notion of forbidden knowledge, the forbidden taste, the forbidden fruit. This is going to anticipate for us the nature of the fall. Man and woman, Adam and Eve, Eve was deceived. Man willfully disobeys by reaching for knowledge in their pride that was withheld from them. The tree of the knowledge of the good and evil. It is for God to know all things. God is omniscient. God defines God is the point of authority over the cosmos. God is in control of all things. God has authority over the dictionary. God has over author authority over the definitions of things. God has authority over what man and what woman are. And man in his temptation and sin sought to know that which is for God to know, to judge that which is for God to judge the temptation to be gods unto themselves. But the spirit knows thou from the first. Remember of man's first disobedience. And now we have knowledge in God from the first, for he was present. And with mighty wings outspread, dove-like sats brooding on the vast abyss. This goes back to Genesis 1. And madest it pregnant. What a powerful word here where the birth of the cosmos was an act of God. But we also think the birth of Christ in the Gospel of Luke, how the Holy Spirit descends upon the Virgin Mary and mates her pregnant. Where we have the Word at the beginning and then we have the Word incarnate, the birth of Christ, possibly even anticipating the second birth, the, the being born again of those who are in Christ. What in me is dark, illumine. Remember Milton's blindness physically, Milton's blindness spiritually as a sinful descendant of Adam's, our own blindness as those who are uh, corrupted by man's first disobedience. The prayer to God is that what in me is dark, illumine. What a beautiful prayer. What is low? Raise and support. Remember the structuring. Instruct me. Raise and support. That to the height of this great argument, he signals to the reader the nature of the poem they are embarking on. Paradise Lost is not a mere text. Paradise Lost is an event. Grant Horner says, we don't read Paradise Lost. Paradise Lost reads us. That to the height of this great argument, I may assert eternal providence. I may champion, I may take the part of, I may defend eternal providence. God's sovereignty over man, God's authorship, God's power, God's omnipotence, and God's sovereign staying hand, and justify the ways of God to men. The term for this thesis is theodicy. I want to read a selection from Grant Horner on this notion of theodicy in Paradise Lost. He says this, This provides the very sticking point of the narrative and sets up the central theological problem which the poem is designed to address. If God created all things and is all-powerful and entirely good, then how does evil come to exist? Is God not strong enough 
or good enough or knowledgeable enough to prevent it? Is he really the source of everything? Is he not therefore in some way the author of evil? Thus the epic exemplifies the genre of theodicy, the philosophical and theological reckoning with the problem of evil. It joins biblical texts such as Job, many of the Psalms, and Ecclesiastes in this obsession. So this is the notion that is going to carry uh, the subterranean reality of the poem. How might one justify the ways of God to men? Do the ways of God need to be justified to men? This prevents much of the complexity of the poem, and this is why it is such a, a beautiful invitation for us to dive into it, that we might also uh, articulate the ways of God to men, that we might also search the ways of God. In Proverbs 25, it says, It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. It is the glory of kings to find it out. And here we hear Milton himself seeking to find that out, asserting eternal providence and justifying the ways of God to men. Notice how these opening lines begin with man's first disobedience. They begin with the problem of evil, of sin, and we end with the ways of God. That perhaps there is a means of redemption in the offing to satisfy the brokenness that man brought into the world. We get this hint in line four. The mortal taste brought death into the world and all our woe with loss of Eden till one greater man restore us and regain the blissful seat. So we need to keep these four, these lines four and five in our minds as we seek to understand Milton's attempt to assert eternal providence and justify the ways of God to men that there is a way that has been made. Remember Jesus has claimed that he is the way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. That is only through this second Adam it's only through Christ that we might be restored to our relationship with God that was lost and that we might regain the place, paradise, that has been lost.